And then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and he blessed them. My next scripture verse is Matthew 18, beginning at verse 1, verses 1 to 7. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. I asked the Lord, how do I follow up the message on the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent enter it by force? Because when I preach that message, of course, the, the theme of that message is, is that you have to really strive and you have to really deny yourself to enter into the kingdom of God. It's something that you have to persevere to get. And the Lord laid this scripture verse on my heart about the little child, that we all need to become like little children to enter into the kingdom of God which to me paints a completely different picture from a violent man violently pushing his way into the kingdom of God. So I thought about it, and the first thing that came to my mind was the story of King Arthur, the legendary king who was king of England and had a group of men that supported him, the Knights of the Round Table. And I want to talk specifically about the Walt Disney rendition of that story, which was called The Sword in the Stone. In the beginning of the movie, they are trying to find who will be the king of England, because there was no king. And there was a sword called Excalibur that was buried into an anvil, into a stone. And so it went out into the countryside that whoever could remove the sword out of the stone would become the king of England. Many great men came from all around. Great and mighty men, men of war, men of status, men of wealth came. Men of wisdom came to take the sword out of the stone, but they all met with the same result. They put their hands around the sword and found that they, they couldn't move it. And the more they found they couldn't move it, the more out of control they got. They became violent. They started screaming. They started striving. Nobody could take the sword out of the stone. Nobody. Until a young boy by the name of Arthur came along. And he came up to the anvil, and I don't know what moved him to to take the sword in the first place, but perhaps he had a sense of destiny. He put his hands on the sword, and it came out as easily as a knife sliding out through butter. And Arthur was crowned the King of England. Now that image was fixed in my mind as I read this scripture verse. The kingdom of God, we said last week, suffers violence, and the violent enter it by force. So that we had established that uh, last week that it takes great determination and perseverance not because God has made it difficult that's not the reason but because it is the sin in our hearts and the challenges and temptations of the world around us and not to mention the attacks of the enemy that make it difficult 
See, we are grown up and we have a lot of baggage. We have a lot of baggage, a lot of hurts, a lot of ways of thinking that are contrary to the Word of God. We have besetting sins that we have engaged in reoccurringly. Uh, there, there are nasty parts of our personality that now developed over years and years. We're adults now. And somehow I find it's difficult for adults who think like adults to receive what the kingdom has. And apparently Jesus agrees with me. Because we established last week that it takes perseverance to get into the kingdom of God. And the older you are, and the more baggage you have, the more difficult it's going to be. And there's a preacher by the name of Kelly Varner who takes it even a step further. He says that this verse doesn't only talk about our entry into the kingdom of God, but it talks about the cross and the resurrection. Think about it. The kingdom of God was personified in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And violence was done to the king. The kingdom of God in Christ suffers violence. He suffered violence when he was tortured and beaten and butchered on the cross. But the violent take the kingdom of God back by force. Jesus was laid in a grave and three days later he violently seized back what was taken away from him. He violently caused the kingdom of God to live again when he rose from the dead, crushing the throat of the devil and blowing the doors open between us and God. The separation between us and God was now gone because the kingdom of God suffered violence when Jesus died. But when Jesus rose, he violently seized back the kingdom and now it's established forever. And so the image that we were exposed to last week and in the last few weeks in fact has been one of pushing and struggling against all odds to enter into the kingdom and walk in its fullness. And that's what we've been talking about. And there's a lot of truth to that because we all know how difficult it can be sometimes and we are well aware that walking in the fullness of the Spirit and living in the kingdom of God in this hostile and corrupt world takes tremendous perseverance and insight. A perseverance and insight that can only be given to you through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Apart from Him, no one can enter into the kingdom of God. But this week, the Lord wants to show us about entering the kingdom from another perspective. He wants to show us that while it may be difficult and we may need to exercise violence and perseverance to get into the kingdom of God, and like those men who couldn't pull out the sword because they were wise and they were rich and they were adults with a lot of hang-ups and a lot of baggage and their hearts were not pure, therefore they could not move the stone, just like them, it's difficult. But for a child, apparently, it's easy. For a child, it's easy to enter into the kingdom of God. And that somewhere along the line, Jesus is telling us that we have to acquire the mind, the heart, and the character of a child if we're going to enter into the kingdom of God at all, let alone walk in the fullness of the king. Mark 10, 15, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And then Matthew 18, 1 to 5, Assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted and you become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one of these little ones like this in my name receives me. Now, the standard interpretation of these particular scripture verses goes like this. The disciples had just heard out of the mouth of Peter by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Christ, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he made that declaration, if you remember, I told you two weeks ago, he made that declaration in a city called Caesarea Philippi, which was nicknamed the Gates of Hell. That city was, was built to honor Julius Caesar. But now Jesus was making a declaration that his kingdom would prevail over the kingdom of Caesar at the very city built in Caesar's honor. So they heard Jesus say to them, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. To you, that is to all of you, not just to Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom of God, that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And how do you think the disciples interpreted that? I'll tell you how they interpreted it. You see, those disciples had lived all their lives 
and had been taught in their synagogues the great Jewish hope. Do you know what the great Jewish hope is? It's the same hope today as it was 2,000 years ago. The great Jewish hope is the restoration of Israel as the favored nation of the world. That's the Jewish hope. That the Jewish people would stop being persecuted, that they would come into their homeland, and that the glory of God through Israel would make Israel the head of all nations. That, to this day, is the Jewish hope. And they started to imagine that Jesus was about to establish an earthly kingdom with his throne in Jerusalem, and that they were going to be appointed as rulers. This is what they were thinking when he said, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. So they imagined themselves being exposed and being appointed to great power, worldly wealth, prominence. Because in the ancient world where they lived, those things were very important. They were important to the Jew and they were important to the Greek too. And students in Greek schools were told of ancient supermen and superwomen and instructed to be like them. The Jews had their supermen and the Greeks had their supermen. Status and money and riches and power were everything. And the more you had of these things, the more important you were considered. So in the ancient world, this is what drove people. This was the ambition of people. Power, a kingdom, prosperity, and with that prosperity, peace. And that's what the Israelites hoped for, and that's what the disciples thought Jesus was talking about when he said, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Oh, that's great. We're going to be graduated now from fishermen into kings. Well, in the ancient world, there were two things that had no status at all. One was women, and the other was children. Now, a woman could gain status by marrying a great man, but a child was a child. A child was powerless, a child was poor, a child held absolutely no value to anybody, regardless of who their father was. And a child did not have access into the finer things of this world. So by taking a child into his hands and saying, you have to become like this child to enter into the kingdom of God, Jesus was saying to his disciples, I know what you're thinking, and you have missed the point altogether. That's not what the kingdom of God is about, and that's not the door that's going to open by the keys that I have given you. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. Jesus was saying that you have to be willing to empty yourself of all pride, all ambition, all worldly desires, any thought of personal gain, because the kingdom of God is not about you. It's about exalting the living God and restoring the earth to its former pure, sinless, and glorious state under his rule. And then, when he had established that point, he started to tell them that he was going to go to Jerusalem to die. He was going to go to Jerusalem and he'd be handed over to the authorities and be put to death, even while these guys were discussing who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're preparing for a crown. Jesus is preparing for a cross. What are you preparing for? What is your conception of the kingdom of God? The cross comes before the crown, not the other way around. But here's what they missed. And when the Spirit of God showed it to me this week, I was absolutely floored. He showed me why Jesus took this child and said that unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And when I saw it, I had to tell you, I bowed my heart before the Lord and I began to worship. I couldn't do anything else. Here's what they missed. What Jesus was telling them was, telling him about the kingdom, telling them about his death, telling them about a child. You put it all together, here's what you get. Jesus was telling his disciples the most important thing, and they missed it, that God the Son would humble himself like a child throwing himself completely into the will of his father and like a child surrender himself entirely to, to accomplish the purposes of the kingdom of God Jesus was telling them if you want to be like me you've got to become like him and as he humbled himself as a child 
The kingdom would not come through worldly wealth and power and might, but through the absolute denial of those things. Because you see, a child had no access to these things. And Jesus had no access to them either, but a child has no choice. God the Son had a choice. He made himself like a child. That you might be here today and celebrate his kingdom. It would come from worldly rejection. Children were rejected by the world. Jesus became like a child. He was rejected. It would come from the stripping away of all worldly dignity. Children had no worldly dignity. Jesus refused all worldly dignity. He became like a child. It came from an emptying, a forsaking of worldly status. Children had no status. Jesus set aside all his status that he might go to the cross for his father. And then finally, it even involved the laying aside of his divine glory. Now that has nothing to do with, the ch with being a, a child in the world, but Jesus even laid aside the fact that he was God the Son, all glorious, all powerful, all awesome. He put it aside, and that would be momentarily forfeited so that the sins of the world would be erased and the power of sin destroyed and the kingdom of God established. Jesus became as a child so that the glory of God would be jump-started into the world. And Jesus became a child and he reflected a child's heart more than any other time in his life when he said this, please follow. This is the heart of a child. This is what you must become if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. He said, Father, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine. In other words, Daddy, all that matters is that I please you and you are delighted in me. When I read that, all of a sudden I was transported back to the days when I was a child. There was one thing in my heart that surpassed everything else. A lot of memories came flooding back when I realized that Jesus made himself like a child. And he spoke to me and said, do you remember what it was like? I remember it was like he was almost talking to me in an audible voice. Do you remember what it was like when you, my son Alex, were a child? I started to remember. Oh yes, I remember. I remembered that the most important thing, more than playing games, more than having toys, more than going out and having fun with my friends, the most important thing to me as a child, and I still vividly remember it, was to please my father. John Lapos. I lived to please him. My mom too, but mostly him. And I can't tell you what joy and satisfaction it brought to my heart when I could sense that Dad was proud of me. Everything I did, everything, was to hear him say, well done. Remind you of anything? I also remembered how awful it felt when I brought him sorrow. And the greatest regret of my life to this day is that when I was a teenager, my life was so messed up, I made my daddy cry. And I would never be able to live that down, never. If it were not for the fact that when Jesus came into my life, he gave me the power to fulfill all my dad's wishes for me, and in particular, graduating for co from college. That's, dad lived for that. He says, you're not gonna wash dishes in the restaurant like I did. And he invested everything he had that I might be one day a college graduate. Well, he died three years before my graduation. He wasn't there, but I knew he would be pleased. And as a son, as a child, my father's pleasure was all that mattered. Well, that's all that mattered to Jesus, too. His father had a plan, and it could never be accomplished unless God the Son submitted himself like a child to utter humiliation as he hung on the cross. Jesus surrendered completely. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said that this is my life. Do you want to know about me? Jesus would say, and I paraphrase what he said, but you can read it in intricate detail in the Word of God. This is my life. This is what I'm about. And now I will quote, my food 
is to do the will of the one who sent me. My father works, and I work. Therefore, if you see me, you see the father. Wow. It's exactly how I felt. When people tell me today, you remind me of your dad. They're not talking about when he was washing dishes or when he was steeped and full of regret about his own failure. They talked about the times when he would go into a Greek wedding dressed up, looking like a king, and walking in with such composure and such dignity that people would turn around and go, who's that? That's what they mean when they say, you remind me of your father. And that's what's necessary to enter into the kingdom of God and to walk in the fullness of the king. To be so totally absorbed in the will of your father, your heavenly father, that all that matters is pleasing him and glorifying him because in your heart you know he must, he must be glorified. I remember what it was like to be a child who was, who so loved his father that all he wanted to do was please him and all those memories started to flood back. I began to understand what is necessary in my heart for me personally to enter into the fullness of the kingdom of God. And when I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus, I transferred that childlike attitude to him. All I wanted to do was please my father in heaven and nothing else mattered. And to this day still, nothing else matters. I have wonderful memories of my dad. But I'm well aware that some of you do not. You didn't have good relationships with your dad. In fact, some of you here had no relationship with your dad at all. Your dad is not with you. He brought you into the world biologically. But he's never been a father to you. And there's been tension between you and him. But when I say the word father, you don't have wonderful memories. You don't feel like a beloved child. You feel like an abused or neglected child. I understand that. Because for you, relating to God as a child is a struggle. But here's what the Spirit of God wants you to do today. You do this in obedience. He'll help you. It's so important that you don't judge God on the basis of what your father was like. Because the Lord is not your father. I'm talking about characteristics. Your father may have been cruel, but God is never cruel. Your father may have been a fool, but God is no fool. He is the source of all wisdom. Your father may have been abusive to you, but God would never violate you and never use you. Never. Your father may have been evil, but there is no trace nor shred of evil in the heart of our God. There just is he is not capable of evil. Your father may have been coarse and unfeeling and unloving towards you. He never cared about you or showed you any affection. But our God is nothing like that. He loves you. He cares about you deeply. He will pour his love into you and you will know that you are precious to him. You will know that you are precious to him. And some of you, and I'm going to say this with all compassion because I know it's going to hurt, were looking for your dad when you got married. And instead you found an abusive husband. So when you think of the Lord, you think of that abusive husband. When you expect the same kind of cruelty from God. But the Lord is not like your abusive husband or your failed love relationship either. He is a God who never fails. He is a God who will never forsake you. He will never leave you. He said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And no one can snatch you out of my hand. And so therefore, you're going to have to let God love you. And you're going to have to allow yourself to embrace him as a father today. Why? Because unless you become like a child... The sword will never come out of the stone. You'll never know what it's like to be a king of, and a priest in the kingdom of God because you will not be able to enter into the kingdom of God. So you've got to open your heart 
And to do that, you have to let go of the hurt and become like a child again. Come here after the service, after I'm done preaching, and allow the Lord to wipe away all the hurt, all the memories of the abuse of man in your life. And I'm talking to men and women today. And allow the Lord to show you who he really is so that you can become that child that is able to enter into his fullness. Unbruised and unblemished. Jesus said that this is essential. It's necessary if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God and live in the fullness of the king. Without that cleansing, without that yielding, without that embracing of the Father, it can't be done. Also, as a side note, I want to point out to you, this is why it is vital for you parents to provide a home for your children that is loving and nurturing and centered on God. And you need to do that so they don't grow up to be damaged goods like us. And I put myself in that category. Not everything in my house was hunky-dory. You need to show them, parents, that you love them, that you want the best for them, that you want to lay down your life for them. Make sure that you make your children feel valuable. Encourage them. Stop putting them down all the time. Stop, stop putting them down all the time. Stop yelling. You've got to learn to stop yelling at your kids. I remember what it was like when my dad yelled at me. It would have hurt less if he had taken a knife and stripped out my heart. You have no idea what damage you do to your kids when you yell at them and you're angry. They make a mistake, get down on your knees and lovingly guide them. And if you need to be firm, be firm, but without anger and without rage. Because our God never rages. When he disciplines, he disciplines in love. Parents, you've got to stop being petty about everything. You've got to stop nagging your children and constantly pointing out their shortcomings and failures. Or when you're old, they won't come around. Why would they go and visit a parent who did nothing but put them down? And they won't. But they'll do the same to the Lord. They won't come around to Him either. Because they will expect the moment they come to the altar, the moment they open their heart or take strides into the kingdom, that He will be there like you, the abusive or the angry parent. Not necessarily abusive. You can be loving and angry too. Pointing the finger at all their shortcomings, telling them why they can't enter in. God is not like that. You may be like that, but God isn't. Discipline them in love, but don't beat them down and don't crush them. And when the time comes for them to serve God, they will willingly run to him without re reservation because they will think to themselves, oh, he might he, God just might be like my mom and dad. God is a lot like my dad. The good parts that I remember. And the good parts that... I choose to remember because I also choose not to remember anything else. Well, I must tell you that I remembered what it was like to be a child and how those feelings and thoughts and attitudes are so important to me now in the kingdom of God. And how wonderful it was to remember dad again and to be reminded of the way he loved me and took care of me. He, he really loved me. And here's what I want to share with you. And as, as I thought about it, I... I felt so strong again, so protected, and all the anxiety and worry in my life began to lift because I remembered that when I was growing up as a child, I never worried about anything. I never worried a day in my life as long as daddy was around. If you have parents like that, get down on your knees and thank God for them every day. If you don't, there's going to be an insecurity that has to be filled. God can fill it. I remember because dad took care of everything and worry and anxiety came later when I became an adult. That's, that's when the worry and anxiety came in. I started to lose my marbles. Started to have to take care of all these things that I never had to take care of before. But as long as I lived with dad, I didn't have to worry about anything. Because you see, I didn't worry about bills when I was in my father's house because dad paid the bills. And in the kingdom of heaven, you don't have to worry about bills either because dad pays the bills in the kingdom of heaven too. He really does. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Dad pays the bills. 
Look what he says in Luke chapter 12, 9. He says, Do not seek what you should eat and what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. Nor have an anxious mind. Man, that disqualifies half of us. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, but your father, your father, children, knows that you need these things, so seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I love the next verse. This is, this is the verse of a tender father talking to his child. Do not fear, little flock. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I can sleep at night now. As a child, I didn't worry about food. Dad provided the food. I didn't fret about where I would sleep because there were plenty of beds in my father's house. Dad provided a home, and Dad will provide a home again. He said, in my, in my father's house there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you, that you may be where I am. And if he can provide a home, then your heavenly Father can provide a home for you now. In fact, here's the beauty of it. Here's the wonderful secret that you all need to know today. The Lord is your home. He is your habitation. The Lord himself is your secure dwelling place. See, when I was home as a child, and I remember this again vividly, Dad was always there. He worked hard, but he always came home. It's wonderful to know that Dad is always home. I felt safe and secure. It might have been awful outside, but I knew the danger would never touch me because I was in my father's house with my father and all would be well. And I think that's what the psalmist David was thinking about when he wrote Psalm 90. Lord, you have been my dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, that's the enemy, and from the perilous pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers. And under his wings you will take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, your house. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him, and with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation, the words of your father to you, the child. When I was a child, I had no fear, because dad absorbed all of my fears. As I got a little older, I learned how to fear. But as a child, my fears never overwhelmed me. Because of my total confidence in my father, I was able to overcome fear. I had to run to him, and dad would hold me, even when I was 16. And all the fears would melt away, all of them. It's the same in the kingdom of God. Your heavenly Father absorbs all your fears. That's why in Psalm 56 it says, Be merciful to me, O God, for, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day he oppresses me. My enemies hound me all day long, and there are many who fight against me. But whenever I am afraid, I trust in you. 
In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. No. I remember how strong I felt when my dad and I walked down the street hand in hand. I was only four years old. I was that high. And dad was not a tall man, but to a four-year-old who's this high, he looked like a giant. He, he was so big. He was so, so strong, so much bigger than me. And he stood tall between me and danger. And as long as my hand was in his, I knew nothing could touch me. Nothing. Because my, my dad would stand in the way. It's the same in the kingdom of God. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house, in the house of my Father of the Lord forever. And I thought about some other attributes of a child that make it so easy to enter into the kingdom of God. A child trusts completely. He believes everything his father tells him. And in the kingdom, it's essential that like a child, you believe everything that the Lord says in his word. Because his word can never fail. A child surrenders entirely. A child is wired for obedience. Now I know when they're two, they, they get into the terrible twos and they have a mind of their own. But uh, they have a much stronger compulsion to obey. Stronger than disobedience. Stronger than disobedience is the desire of a child to obey the father and mother whom he trusts. Believe me on that. Because I remember what it was like. When I was growing up, I remembered how important it was at the earliest of age to please my dad. And yeah, I disobeyed him at times, but I would much rather obey him and give him pleasure. There was a stronger compulsion in me towards obedience. But that wears off when you get to be 12, when you get to be 13, when you get into puberty, when you think now you know more than your parents know. In fact, they're old-fashioned and stupid and dull because here you are, you're, you're texting on a smartphone without looking. And your mother can't even log into a computer because she doesn't remember the password and then you have to explain to her what the password is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the older you get, the more difficult it is to comply. But a child is submissive and compliant because God has weaved obedience into the heart of the child while they are young. I didn't always enjoy discipline. My dad was a very, very heavy disciplinarian. I hated punishment. I hated it, but I understood it. Oh yes, I knew when I was wrong. I knew when I deserved to stand in the corner. That was my mother's punishment. And I knew when I deserved a couple of shots with the belt, that was my dad's punishment. And I preferred my mother's much more. But worse than the punishment, worse than the punishment, was making dad unhappy. I couldn't bear that. How important how important that attitude is for the kingdom of God because we all have a rebellious streak from time to time. But because we have the Spirit of God living in us, we don't have to worry that our desire to obey has been snuffed out by arrogant maturity. No. The Spirit of God is also like a child. He is the most submissive of the three members of the Trinity. He has no authority whatsoever of his own. He never exercises authority. The Spirit of God, more than any of the, the other two, does what he is told. The Father has authority. The Son submits to the Father. The Son has authority, but the Spirit submits to both. So you have the most submissive being in the universe living in you. You are able 
to obey. And when you rebel, you grieve him. Just like I remember grieving when my dad was hurt because of something that I had done. A child knows what it wants and it will badger their father until they get it. Dad, can I have it? Can I have it? Dad, can I have it? Can I have it? Dad, please, can I have it? Dad, oh, Dad, can I have it? You're at dinner. Dad, can I have it? Dad, can I have it? Dad, even little Joshua, he doesn't give up. Dad, can I have it? Can I, can I have it? Ella Sophia, I'm sure, is the same way. <laughs> can I have it? Can... Amazing. I was the same way. I was like that till I was 20. <laughs> and you know, every year when I was a child, I would remind my dad time and time again what I wanted for Christmas. And boy, did he ever get annoyed. And he had this low voice, hey, Alec. That's how he sounded like. He used to call me Alec. Alec, be quiet. Dad, I want a Mighty Mo. Mighty Mo cannon, you know, little big plastic cannon that fires cannonballs at 100 miles an hour. Almost took my sister's head off with that thing. Dad, I want a great Garloo, a big green ugly monster. Didn't do anything. <laughs> Had a remote control. All it did was zzz, uh, uh. That was it. Dad, I want a green ghost game. I had all these things that I wanted. And every Christmas, amazingly enough, I would unwrap my gift and sure enough, there was my Mighty Mo and there was my Garloo and there was my, there was my green ghost game and there was everything I ever desired because it made dad more happy to give to me the desires of my heart than it was for me to receive them. And that's what my dad was like. And guess what? Your heavenly father is exactly the same way. And I remember dad getting down on his knees and playing with my toys. He liked them better than I did. And I got a lot of pleasure watching dad playing with that green monster. Don't ever think that your heavenly father is stingy or difficult or that he withholds blessing more than he releases it because it's not true. It's a misconception that we need to put out of our minds once and for all. So let's believe what the word of God says. Dad gave me every Christmas gift I ever asked him for. Oh, he got annoyed with me and sometimes he would tell me, shut up. And sometimes he'd just get mad and say, if you don't stop bugging me, you're going to get the belt. But every Christmas, there it was. Because he loved me so much. And the word of God says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven good, give good gifts to those who ask him? So don't be afraid to ask. We're learning how to pray. So please understand from this morning, that your dad longs for you to come into the secret place and reveal to him the desires of your heart so that he can give you the desires of your heart and he'll take more pleasure in giving than you will in receiving. Trust me on that. How do I know that? Because that's what my dad was like and he was a reflection of my heavenly dad. That's why you need to become like a child to enter into the kingdom of God. Become like a child. Ex expect to receive. Because your father wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. Now, of course, not everything is good for you. There were some things that I asked dad to get and he'd say, no. Please, dad, you're not going to get it, okay? Okay. But in time, you get to know your dad and you become like him and you learn what is worth pursuing. And you know something about my dad? He never withheld from me what was worth pursuing. Are you listening to that? He never withheld from me what was worth pursuing. And you know how I learned what was worth pursuing? He taught me what was worth pursuing. It's the same with your heavenly father. He will, through his word, teach you what is worth pursuing and what is worth rejecting. And this world is worth rejecting. Popularity is worth rejecting. Wealth is worth rejecting. Honor and fame and glory and glitter is worth rejecting because in the, in the end, those things bring death. But what is worth pursuing is righteousness, peace, and joy, and all of the characteristics of the, of the kingdom of God, and ultimately, Jesus is worth pursuing. And in the light of all that, I realized where the violent struggle takes place. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent enter it by force. I understood now where the violence takes place, exactly what that violent struggle is about. It's about this. The struggle, the violent struggle, is to enter into the kingdom of heaven, is to allow the Spirit of God to transform you from an adult into a child. That's where the struggle is.
to be transformed from an adult with hang-ups and baggage and sin and hurts and your own way of thinking and your own stubborn attitudes and your intellectual objections into a child to transform you from someone who is self-sufficient and maybe a little bit cynical and maybe a little bit bitter all that adult stuff to put that away and to come before the Lord with an entirely pure, unblemished, unstained heart, free from the past, free from the attitudes of the world, just an open and wide slate for the Father to write on. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. And born again signifies you must become like a child. You must be born again as a child into the kingdom of heaven and take the hand of your father and walk with him in total and absolute confidence and, de and dependence. Otherwise, you'll never enter the kingdom of God at all. And if you have entered into the kingdom of God, that's how you have to continue to walk with your father. We get saved sometimes as a child and then we become mature Christians. We, we know our Bible and we know how to pray. You know how to pray and read your Bible while you're struggling so much. We think we know. And that is the great fault of adults. They think they know because they're adults. When in fact, compared to the Father, they know nothing. And I would rather know nothing before my Father than to stand up in my own knowledge and fall flat on my face. I'll become like a child for Him anytime. In absolute obedience, and dependence. Now I've been without my dad for 35 years. I can't believe it's been that long. I miss him terribly. And I've counted the times over and over again when I've wanted to run to him when things got tough. Because that's what I used to do all my life until he died. I can't tell you the number of times that I long to seek his counsel about things. To hear his wisdom. don't know if I'm going to get through this, but especially to feel his pleasure one more time. I'd give everything I have up to have that. Mm -hmm. To see him, and I've said it a thousand times, sitting in the front row, right there with Shamar, that's where he'd be. So proud and so satisfied that his son was able to overcome his baggage and be something. His smile which I've imagined every Sunday would be worth all the treasures of the world combined. But he's not here. And the sense of loss in my life is constantly felt. Don't think that it isn't. I miss him every day. And as a result of not having him in my life anymore, I know what it's like not to have your father in your life. I've spent more years without him than I did with him. And that's why I can tell you how terrible it would be if you would live your life without your heavenly father. I miss my dad every day. And there are many reasons for that, but I tell you, it's much worse to live without your heavenly Father and to live a life without God, much worse. Because someday life is going to catch up to you. You may have the whole world ahead of you now. You may think you've got it all together. But do you realize you're just one step away from crisis? It's not in front of you, it's right here, walking beside you. And from one minute to the next, tragedy that is no respecter of age, no respecter of who you are, what your, who your family is, or how righteous you have been. Tragedy may strike you at any time. And if you don't have your Heavenly Father in your life when tragedy strikes, I tell you the sense of loneliness and despair you will feel will be overwhelming and insurmountable. I mean, it's bad enough I don't have my physical, my, my earthly dad here. There have been times when I have cried because he hasn't been here not here but I'm not an orphan I'm not an orphan because my heavenly father is with me 
every day. And he wanted me to share with you today a message that is totally not my style. You should know that by now. You say, what, what, who is this guy preaching today? I'm even wondering myself. I'll tell you who it is. It's Pastor Alex Lapos, the child, who is totally dependent on his dad, telling you on his behalf, this is what you need to become to enter into the fullness of the kingdom of God. That sword in the stone. That sword of the king. That sword of victory. That sword of royalty is meant for you to pull out. But your heart has to be pure. Your heart has to be clean. Your heart can have no bitterness or disappointment in it. Your heart has to be full of joy and fully trusting in the Father who sent Jesus Christ to die on your behalf. Only then will you be able to pull the sword out of the stone. Only then will you be, will you be able to enter into the fullness of the kingdom of God. Rex, can you go to your guitar? And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a time of healing. And my appeal is very simple. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. If you've been hurt by your father or your husband or your live-in boyfriend, it doesn't matter. We're not condemning anybody. We're just... If you've been hurt by a man in your life, if you are continuing to be hurt by a man in your life, it has to be healed today. You cannot continue with that hurt. Let me tell you why. I've, I've heard some of you relate to me that uh, some of you single ladies that you want to be married again. And I, I agree. I'm praying for you all to find husbands. And I've been praying that a man of God would come into your life. And I think it would be appropriate if that man of God was not given a heart full of dirt and hurt, a heart full of bitterness. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that when that man of God walked in through that door, as I believe he will, I have no doubt, or you meet him in a conference, or you by accident run into him in a Starbucks, you just never know, that he would find a complete and whole woman. But if you're a man, same thing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that person found a complete and whole man? Of course. The other thing is, is that God is going to open up horizons for us. He's been speaking to us about our destiny. Can you really enter into the destiny that your heavenly Father has? When in your heart now are the criticisms and put-downs of your dad that are still there? No, they have to go. Because they'll prevent you from entering in. Those are just two reasons why you need to be healed. You're in a marriage. Do you really believe that in a marriage that you'll be able to be fully intimate and fully trusting of your spouse, man or woman? That applies to both. If you are still nursing wounds that haven't healed yet, they could be the most loving person on the face of the earth. When they start to approach you, you know what the first thing you're going to do is? <laughs> Rear back and cover your wounds. It's the same thing with the Lord. When the Lord begins to approach, and you'll, as you learn to pray, this is going to happen. You'll feel the presence of God in such a mighty way as you learn to enter into His fullness. The presence of God is like a blanket. It's like a presence. And if you're really blessed, sometimes he might even give you a vision and show himself to you. Anything's possible with the Lord. But it's always the same. He comes, and I'll show it to you physically. And he begins to sweep over you like that. You can feel the presence of God. He sweeps over you like that. The love and the purity and the holiness is overwhelming. And if you have hurt in your heart, you'll run. 
because you won't be able to stand it. A bruised heart cannot long stand in the presence of a pure heart. It's not possible. That's why your heart needs to be cleansed this morning. And it will be. Because to enter the kingdom of God, you have to become like a child. I'm going to ask Rex to sing home. Home is about the father of the prodigal son. The prodigal son expected his father to reject him, but the prodigal son's father was like God. And as Rex sings it, listen, and when you feel moved, come forward. And when we're all gathered together, we'll pray. And we're going to minister to each other today. We're not going to have the pastor or the council pray for you. We will pray a general prayer, but I'm going to have you pray for one another. That you'll be healed of all the hurts. And that you'll become children again. Because the kingdom of God is yours to possess. You've been, you were given a key to the kingdom. Your father gladly gives it to you. And the blessings that he has and the glory that he has in store for you has to be received by a pure heart. It cannot be received any other way. So as Rex sings, bow your heads. And when you feel moved, when that hurt rises up, come and stand with me up front here and no one will condemn you don't be shy just let the spirit of God lead you this morning here is Home by Rex Versosa been searching is when the shadows come I've nowhere to go my one last hope God only knows in him I find what I've been searching right now I'm on my way back to a place where I can hear his voice and see his face as I'm on my way I see him running before I take my second step He sees me coming back And he comes running to me And he comes running Takes me in his arms Closer to his heart Saying he'll be loving me Cause he's never stopped loving me No, I can't live without you with me All my fears disappear Right before my eyes Just to know your love is with me It's when the shadows come I've nowhere to go My one last hope God only knows In Him I find what I've been searching But right now I'm on my way Back to a place where I can hear His voice And see His face As I'm on my way I see Him running Before I take my second step He sees me coming back and he comes running to me He comes running Takes me in his arms 
closer to his heart saying he'll be loving me cause he's never stopped loving me then I stopped and said give me Lord for walking out the door but before I can say anything more he says hush I'm just glad to know that you've Come home, back in my arms, safe from harm. I'm just glad to know your home, where I made you to be, right here with me. You're a man and you need to be here, get up. We men have such a hard time admitting these kinds of things, but you're gonna have to put your pride aside and don't sit there and assume that everything is okay. It's not. If it was okay, I wouldn't have preached this message. It's not okay. Get up and come and stand here with the rest. You think it's okay, but you know full well it isn't. And here's how you know. If your father or the man in your life were to insult you again, one more time, how would it feel? Would you be able to shake it off? No, you wouldn't. The rage would come back all over again, wouldn't it? Now, if you know that, then you need to be here. And you need to stand with us. Get up. I will come and get you if you don't get up. This is important. I'm going to need the, those of you that are sitting to come and find someone to pray for. Would you stand and come and find someone to pray for? Stand right in front of them. And then I'm going to turn people who are standing up here into each other. And those of you that are all standing to receive will pray for each other. And there's going to be a tremendous healing in this place. A tremendous healing in this place. Because it's not about the prayer so much. It's about what your Father, your Heavenly Father is going to do. Now, if you're up here crying, he's already doing it. If you're up here weeping, he's already removing the hurt. He's already taken away the pain. So you're going to feel it. You're going to feel it maybe very profoundly. But it'll be the last time. It'll be the last time. After today, you won't feel it anymore. Not the same way. You'll remember it maybe, but you won't feel it. Because God has a bigger plan for you. Much bigger plan for you. And a part of that plan is to break away from the hurt that has been planted in your heart. You, because you must become like a child to enter into the kingdom of God. So I'm going to come down now and I'm going to let the Spirit of God lead me. And I'm going to bring people together and you pray for one another. And then we'll go downstairs and we'll have some lunch. Have you three guys pray together.
Jonathan and Kevin and Dan Mahedrin. Faustina, I have you here. Could you come with me? Debbie and Ann, would you come with me around the front? Brought you some friends. Debbie and Ann are coming too. Right here. Can I have Daniela and... Take him over here. You can pray for your sister, but I need people who speak French. Right here. John and Shamar and Selwyn, you can go in there. And Elise, come. Go with Christina. Uh, Helen, over here. Good here. Tony's good here. Really pray for each other, and I know God's going to do great things. Brother Jeff. Johnny, brother Je uh, Lisa, Darshan, Heidi. Uh, uh, uh. Heidi, Darshan, over, uh, go with the guys. Right, yeah, right there with the four. The, you guys pray. Pray for uh, Heidi. Heidi will pray for you. and Patrick, you can turn in towards each other. Can I have Sister Biney come forward? Sister Biney? S Sister Biney? Would you come? Come and help me. Thank you, Jesus. A new birth right now, Father God. Sing something else. Take your time. God is moving. There's a tremendous healing going on here. Tremendous healing. In you, you've never 
I believe you're my healer. I believe you were all I need. It's a life of empowerment beyond our ability. I believe which includes your my portion that will never suffer the pain I believe you more than it now for me that's what you want to do for them today Jesus your role I'm not afraid Lord I need you would open up the windows of heaven give her a financial blessing greater than she's receiving now you hold my hand every moment and the needs are great Lord Jesus and you calm my reign becoming seems I pray Lord for opportunities for income walk with me through fire because their God will supply all and healed all my disease your faithful Lord I trust in you. I trust in you. I believe you're my healer. I believe you were wrong. I need. I believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I When you're finished praying, just come and stand forward. We're going to close all together. Just come towards the altar close, and I'm going to have Kofi pray a general prayer right now. So don't go away. Come forward. If you're not finished praying, continue praying, and Kofi will just pray as you pray. So Kofi, would you come? There he is. And for those of you that are praying, continue to pray. Those of you that have stopped praying, let's focus in on what Kofi is going to offer to the Lord. And then we're dismissed. We'll go downstairs. God bless you. I believe you're my healer. I believe you were all I need. If you would make this confession together. I believe you're my portion. more than enough for me I believe I believe you're my healer I believe you are all I need make this confession this afternoon you are all we need everything that we could ever dream for everything that we could ever hope for you are everything father that 
our hearts could ever desire is in you O most high God you are the father to the fatherless you are the lover of our souls you bring comfort and joy to those who need Father, we come to you with all humility and sincerity, in spirit and in truth, laying ourselves down, laying down our burdens at your feet, at this altar, and asking, Father, that you will take away every hurt that you will wipe away every pain in the name of Jesus because Christ was wounded for our transgressions Christ was hurt and rejected that we might be accepted And Father, in the name of Jesus, together as one body, as your children, we declare that by the done and completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, by him being crushed, by him being bruised, by him being rejected and scorned, by him going through physical and spiritual pain and separation, that father we are accepted that father we accepted that father we are received that father we are restored that father we are reconciled in the name of Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Lord father we thank you that while we were yet sinners you died for us to reconcile us back to you and father I pray that that power of reconciliation begin to work in our hearts and in our minds oh God father that even as you have forgiven us of the greater transgression oh God that you will grant us grace to forgive our earthly fathers forgive our earthly leaders to forgive the men in our lives who have hurt us in the name of Jesus and even as we have declared that you are our, our healer oh God I pray that you will grant us the grace to forgive and be healed right now right now right now in this moment right now yes, Lord. by the blood of Jesus let there be a cleansing Thank let there be a cleansing let there be a cleansing of our hearts let there be a cleansing of our Hallelujah. minds Hallelujah. let there be a cleansing of our emotions let there be a cleansing of even the physical scars on our body in the name of Jesus And I pray, Father, that we will not leave this altar the same. But we will leave knowing that we are accepted. We are accepted by our Heavenly Father. We are accepted by our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. We are accepted by our Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus. Would you do me a favor and lift up your right hand? And make this declaration I am accepted I am accepted by my Heavenly Father by my Heavenly Father I am accepted accepted into the kingdom of God into the kingdom of God I am accepted I am accepted by my Heavenly Father by my Heavenly Father and nothing nothing will stand in the way nothing will stand in the way of my acceptance my acceptance Amen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God.
Give the Lord a clap offering. Praise God. God bless you. Turn around and hug somebody before we go downstairs. Have a wonderful day.